here for a little while. We're, gonna, we're just um, smoothing out some of the glitches, I would say, of the first day. Like catering should come at 11.15, not at 11.25. So at least those of you who come early have an impetus to like eat well and you know, ponder the day or whatever with food. Um, I want to do some introductions very briefly because we have some new faces and wonderful GAs and staff members who've just joined us, literally. Uh, so we'll briefly do that, and then I'm, being, I'm delighted to moderate today and introduce Dr. Caroline Lynette, who's, who's our, our main act. So let me begin with some of the um, introductions. My name is Jennifer Hyman, and I'm the director at the Center for Refugee Studies, so welcome to all of you to a new year of the seminar series. Uh, we've circulated one almost final version of this, the talks this fall, but we're going to dot our I's and cross our T's and get our get uh, a couple of more details uh, together before we send out the final, final copy. But uh, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce you to two people who are new at CRS, um, whose names I may pronounce incorrectly, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, Kathy Mirzan, standing here, Hi, has just joined us as an administrative assistant on a 2.5 hours per week basis for a year. Um, and she's also an MES graduate student. <coughs> We're very lucky to have scooped her from Schulich, no less. Um, so we are delighted to have her at CRS Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays. Um, and Kathy will be assisting, along with Michelle, um, on the seminar series as the staff liaison. And as of today, we are also delighted to introduce our graduate assistant who's helping us, a master's in social work student, Hatije, over there. Sali? Chili. 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 A lovely name that I obviously haven't yet quite learned how to pronounce. Um, and she's going to be our uh, liaison for the, for the uh, seminar series this year. So we're delighted to have both of you and we're in fact delighted to have all of you here. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce Dr. Caroline Lynette. I was calling her Caroline for the first little while, but you did introduce yourself as Caroline, right? Yes, that's Okay. Um, that Aussie accent made me think that she was, you know, <laughs> telling me the truth. But in fact, Caroline is um, an immigrant to Australia in 2005. She will tell you, I think, more about yourself biographically. Yeah. <laughs> okay, because um, I met Caroline in the summer school, and she has been with us here at CRS since May um, on what is called the Endeavour Fellowship, a very prestigious Australian um, fellowship that takes you afar. And uh, she has won that for good reasons because, uh, very briefly, uh, Caroline got her PhD from Queensland University of Technology in 2011. Before coming here, she was the lecturer and first year coordinator at the School for Human Services and Social Work at Griffiths University in Brisbane. While she was here, she got interviewed on Skype in Quebec City in August at 10 o'clock at night by a panel of people at the University of New South Wales, and she's been offered a job as a senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales. Yay. Um, since she's been here, she's written no fewer than four papers. I think that's four months, four papers? Four and a half months, sorry. Uh, if you could just give me a little uh, bottle of what you're <laughs> sipping in your coffee, I, I'd like some of that. Um, some of her research grants, um, in fact, the, the four most recent ones, all have used the key word women at risk, and the, the one that does not have women at risk in it, I think might win the research grant best title prize, which is, to, is called Crossroads, Interdisciplinary Music Health Intersections. Music health, I, 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 I mean those two for me um, are new, but, but it makes perfect sense because Caroline's research focuses on mental health and the well-being of refugees and asylum seekers. And she uses ethnographic, community-based, participatory, visual methods to do that. So without further ado, I could go on and on. In fact, I only printed the first three and a half pages of the CV. But please join me in welcoming Caroline. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for such a lovely welcome. And thank you, everybody, for attending today. Um, so as Jennifer has mentioned, the last 10 years um, have been significant for me moving to Australia to pursue my career um, and become an academic. Uh, but I started off in um, social policy um, at the state level in multicultural policy and then I moved on to transcultural mental health for a little while. 
And once I started my PhD and um, focused on the resilience and well-being of refugee women, that really sort of uh, launched me into the pathway that I'm in now. And um, this project, um, the Crossroads project that Jennifer mentioned, is um, the one that I've been working on for the last 12 months. And this is the basis for my presentation today. So um, just a couple of things about the, um, the findings that I'll be discussing today is that they are preliminary findings and we're in the process of refining those findings and further testing um, the framework that I'll talk about. Um, and because I've had um, the pleasure of being here, um, but I also represent a whole team of researchers from Griffith University and I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, particularly the lead researcher, Dr. Naomi Sunderland. So I'll talk about their roles in a bit more detail. So I'll focus today on um, the link between music and well-being for asylum seekers or refugee claimants. And the group of uh, asylum seekers I'm uh, focusing on are those who are in a detention centre in Brisbane, the Brisbane Immigration and Transit Accommodation. So this is the group that I'll be talking about. So just a bit of an overview, so I'll talk briefly about the context um, give you uh, an idea of, the, of our research rationale. I'll talk about the project in a bit more detail um, and then I'll explain our framework and the key themes in our framework. I'll, I'll spend a bit of time giving you some examples from the narratives which form the basis of the framework and then there will be a bit of time for performance. Not from me, uh, but it's a, it's a recorded video from the group that I'll be talking about. Okay. So Australia is um, sadly notorious for the harshness and um, one might say the foolishness of its um, policy towards asylum seekers. And I, I, I do not unfortunately have enough time to take you through the system that's quite complex and, and, and always changing. Um, but I found this article that summarises the current um, policy framework and the current government approach. Um, and retraces the Pacific solution and um, sort of the lead up to what we are currently experiencing now. Um, about a year ago, the department um, who's, who's responsible for immigration um, changed its name from Department of Immigration and Citizenship to Department of Immigration and Border Protection. So that sent a clear message about the mandate um, for the government that came into power 12 years ago. And um, Stop the Boats was part of the slogan for the election campaign. So you could see it on TV, you could hear it on the radio, you could see it on billboards. It was a massive part of the election campaign. And um, Prime Minister Tony Abbott won possibly um, because of some of that. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll be happy to share those references later on if, um, if people are interested. The other um, part of the context that I want to set is that as part of the um, background for the research project, um, Naomi Sunderland and myself uh, conducted a, a scoping review of the literature to look at how music and singing and music projects were being used with um, refugees in different contexts. So we focused on how music was used in conflict resolution, um, in refugee camps and in situations of exile, as well as in countries of resettlement. And part of it also explored, uh, also involved exploring the more detrimental uses of music in relation to forced migration. And so what we found was that there wasn't much that was being said uh, between uh, how music uh, had an impact um, on well-being and mental health issues. And one of the reasons for this is, um, as, as you might already um, know, that uh, governments and non-government organisations and agencies are more concerned, um, and, and rightly so, about safety protection um, uh, rather than looking at some of the cultural needs of groups that are transient. Um, but from that scoping, we, we found that there is actually um, an avenue for exploring how um, ex expressing cultural identity through, through musical activities and singing is actually, can actually become a huge contributor to ment uh, positive mental health and well-being. So there's, that, um, there's definitely scope for further research on that topic. Um, so this paper will become available possibly in the list, uh, next couple of weeks as well. Um, okay, so moving on now to the rationale for the project. Um, you're probably f very familiar with this as well, is that it's already challenging to conduct research in forced migration contexts, um, in exile or even in resettlement countries. And trying to link research projects with detention centres 
um, is a no-no, basically. Uh, it, it doesn't happen. It's not likely to happen in the near future. Um, the, the culture of secrecy that's been increasing um, over the past 12 moment, months in Australia is not uh, conducive to, to having more transparency about what's going on in the detention centres and how um, the mental health of uh, asylum seekers is being affected. So those of us who are interested uh, in understanding those experiences and who are concerned about social justice issues need to seek alternative ways of understanding what, what's going on in a place that we can't see, that we can't access. So we use resources like reports or newspaper articles. I've provided two examples here. Um, the first one is um, a report by Nicholas Proctor and colleagues from a site visit in Nauru earlier, that was released earlier this year. And the second one is a newspaper article that follow, uh, focuses on the mental health of uh, children in detention. So these kind of sources are full of examples of how their mental health is being compromised. So this is one way for us of understanding what, what's going on. Um, compared to researchers and academics, musicians are seen as non-threatening, non-political, fairly harmless, and so they're granted access to the detention centres. Um, Brian Prokopis, who is the lead uh, facilitator we're working with, always tells the story of how um, when they decided to provide support to the detained asylum seekers, they rang the detention centre in Brisbane and they said, he said, we're a group of um, social workers, counsellors, psychologists, we'd like to come in and, and provide support um, to the asylum seekers and they got a resounding no. A week later, he rang again and he said, we're a group of musicians, singers, composers, would like to come in and play music with the asylum seekers. And they said, please come. <laughs> um, so it's actually been a privilege to be working with this group, Sweet Freedom, and to get to know the projects that they've um, worked on over the past few, few years, including the, the Scattered People Project, which was a, a, a CD based on songs written by asylum seekers. Um, so I want to show you a brief video that sums up the rationale and talks about um, uh, the impetus for research on that particular topic. I should mention too, so that um, Sweet Freedom attends the uh, Brisbane Immigration and Transit Accommodation once a week um, and has done so for the last three years. But they also organise a monthly gathering in the community with asylum seekers who now live in the community and um, for those who are interested to provide support and to engage in music as well. So I've had the opportunity of attending those monthly meetings, but not the weekly um, interactions. Let's see if my... Okay. <laughs> سهرجت الحمى والسمين ونجى لو عدت ما سلم من سعد خيالي مسيح والكلام تاني سمعت العرس لا خبري أكيد لي ليتك البجد والكلام تاني well, at a time where governments around the world are really grappling with their policies around asylum seekers and refugee communities, and in places like Australia, where quite frankly we're heading into very troubling territory, I think the need for the arts to respond is more pressing than ever. And when you look at programs like The Scattered People and the way in which music is used to give asylum seekers and refugees a voice, an opportunity to have dignity, an opportunity to be a human and to connect with others, to voice stories, to share experiences in a positive, affirming kind of way. There's a lot to be said for that. In fact, the Queensland Conservatory Research Centre is very, very interested in the work that the scattered people have been doing, so much so that they've recently invested into research to try and understand and unpack what is happening in this important space and the way that the arts can provide a channel for asylum seekers and refugees to really connect with one another, to have a sense of dignity, to be humans and treated as humans. And we're very, very excited about some of the outcomes that are coming from this research and this work.
past nine months, researchers at the Queensland Conservatorium of Music Research Centre have been working with the Scattered People and the Scattered People's um, chairperson, Brian Procopus, to start to explore some of the links between the music making that happens in the Scattered People and broader health and wellbeing for the people involved and their surrounding families and communities. We found that music researchers have identified many great benefits for people and these range from cultural renewal, um, allowing people to practice important family ceremonies and rituals, um, allowing people to be part of the community, to share their own culture with other people, to learn about other cultures, to develop um, a sense of community across division and across um, cultural and ethnic divides where there may be conflict in a home situation. So there's all these sorts of different benefits um, that are quite broad for communities as well as some very specific benefits for people like stress relief and a feeling that they can express themselves emotionally and, and spiritually for many people through their music practice. On the health side, we've also found extremely good support for these kinds of outcomes that in a, by enabling people to practice their cultures through music and to connect with one another through music, we unlock a wealth of health and wellbeing benefits that can have very long-term positive effects in people's lives. So what we're trying to do with our research now is to draw these two bodies of research together across music, health and wellbeing to really give a good, strong evidence base for what organisations like the Scattered People do with and for one another. As part of this junior fellowship, we were also able to spend some time interviewing the music facilitators themselves. And we discussed what kind of impact they thought they were actually having on asylum seekers given the regular interactions they've had in detention and in the community as well. But more importantly, we started discussing what kind of impact the, these interactions with asylum seekers was having on the music facilitators and how they made sure that their well-being was not compromised by the stories they were hearing and the relationships that they developed with asylum seekers. So we decided that in the future we should look at how working in a community music setting with asylum seekers has an impact on the music facilitators and this will help us to better support music facilitators and groups like Sweet Freedom in their endeavours with asylum seekers in detention and in the community. I think music uh, is a universal language between people around the world for sharing their feeling and that way. Uh, I love the scattered people because it's a good opportunity or situation that you can find uh, a lot of people from different nationalities, different countries that you can share your feeling and uh, your music and you can hear a lot of different music from different countries. I've been participating with scattered people for uh, three years now. It just brings me that opportunity to meet wonderful people like Jaffa. Um, from different countries, from different with different experiences, um, with lots of talents. What do you think about the group uh, together? Yeah, we're we coming together here, and it's uh, I really, really enjoy that. I love the way that everyone, old, young, and all cultures come together and, and just enjoy each other and enjoy each other's differences. And I've been with them now for nearly three and a half years, and I've met many beautiful families, and they've become a part of my family. We all love music and music is very important to all of us and I really enjoy being here today. It's really special to be part of the Scattered People experience and experience the absolutely beautiful songs that the team produces. And it's a privilege to be singing that with them and you get an insight into, from the diverse number of people, the drastic problems they have. It's an amazing perspective.
songs away for a little bit longer, but uh, you'll get a chance to hear a bit more at the end. Um, okay. um, just a note about the songs as well that um, are used in the, in the gatherings. Um, most of them are written based on um, asylum seeker input, so the, the music facilitators ask them, you know, what do you think about when you're awake at 3 o'clock in the morning? And they just recorded the responses and then turned that into a song. Um, other songs are based on poems, so some of um, the participants wrote poems and then they, they created a melody and turned that into a song. And the last song that you heard, a Persian song, um, that was actually taught to the music facilitators by um, detained asylum seekers from Iran. So that started the development of a, of a certain culture within the detention centre. Um, so I want to ask you now, what, what do you think music um, does for you? What kind of place is it hold in your everyday life? How do you feel about music? Would anyone like to share? <laughs> I see lots of smiles. Uh, it helps me clean. <laughs> Another way I'm cleaning, I need to put some music on to get some <laughs> to get pumped about cleaning. But would anyone like to say what they how they consider music in their lives? Yes. Um, I sing my kids' lullabies at night, and for us, that's one of the most special times of the day. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, it creates a connection, a, a very unique connection, isn't it? Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Well, when I want to be like in a place, that place I am in Pacific, I just listen to kind of music which reminds me in some places, yes. especially like back home. Yes. And get back to all of these nice memories, which is like I can listen to my music and just smile by myself. Yeah. Which is yes. memories coming. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. I've never been able to meditate very well, so music is like relaxation. Yes. Deep, you know, breaths that are not. <laughs> yes. Which yeah. I'm too good at. Yeah. It can help to slow down. Yes. Um. So I guess. Uh, the, the reason why we're focusing on music in this project, um, and, and we're focusing on participatory music or community music, which is different to music therapy. So I said before, there's not a lot of literature. There's a lot of literature on music therapy, but not so much on participatory music um, with refugees and asylum seekers. It's because of all the reasons that you just named. Um, when trying to make connections um, in a very artificial environment, um, people who may not speak the same language or who may have gone through quite an ordeal um, before arriving to that particular location. Um, music can achieve some of those aspects of, of um, creating a sense of connection, um, being ha having a set, uh, um, an element of universality that doesn't require to be, to be able to speak the same language to understand the message behind a particular song, for example. So participatory music, um, like singing, songwriting and recording, are increasingly recognised as supportive, therapeutic and empowering for marginalised, culturally diverse populations. So the, the common element with music therapy is that therapeutic element um, that's also present um, now in the literature on participatory music. Okay, so a bit more now on the Crossroads project. Um, so it was funded last year for 12 months. It was an internal grant. Um, and there were three phases to the project, a systematic literature review on how participatory music projects are used with culturally diverse um, communities and groups, um, the narrative analysis, so that's the, the section I was involved in and I'll talk about this a bit more, um, as well as interviewing um, some music facilitators and some asylum seekers who are now living in the community. So the common thread, in a way, was um, to employ a social determinants of health framework to analyse the findings in those three phases. And um, this was very useful because we were an interdisciplinary team with um, researchers from health, music, humanities, social work, cross-cultural studies. So we all came from different backgrounds. Um, we formed little research subgroups um, to focus on each phase of the project. And we, within those subgroups, we also had a mix of senior researchers and, and junior researchers and research assistants for that mentoring element. Um, so this was quite innovative in terms of a project of, a, of that nature and created a lot of diversity in our approaches, in our analysis, which was the most important, and also creates diversity now in our writing, which is quite a bit of a challenge to be reporting on those findings. So the narratives, they're narratives from the facilitators. 
Um, from the time that they accessed the detention centres in June 2011, um, they've been recording what's been going on every time they've gone to sing and play music with the asylum seekers. And they've been disseminating those narratives through a network of supporters, initially through a blog, but now also through an email, email list. Um, so they contain anecdotes of the weekly visits. Um, and um, Brian Prokopis, the lead facilitator, is responsible for that to keep going. He writes most of the narratives, but he also um, gets a lot of input from the other music facilitators, depending on what's been going on that month. So it's not just one voice speaking, but it's a, a collective account from all the music facilitators who have a regular interaction with the Sami Seekers. So we do recognise that the accounts and the narratives are, are mediated through the facilitators' perspectives, and um, that's given us a, a very specific approach to adopt in our analysis. But this is as close as possible as we can get to, to gaining some insights in terms of the mental health and well-being of the detained asylum seekers. Until such time, um, the system allows for more transparent or more systematic um, research to take place. So the, the thematic analysis that I'll be talking about um, concerns 11 narratives from the year 2012. And um, so there were three researchers, myself from Human Services, um, Dr. Donna Weston from the Queensland Conservatorium and Associate Professor Patricia Wise from the School of Humanities. We all analysed uh, the narrative separately and then we came together and combined our analysis um, that forms the, base, the basis for the framework. As you can imagine, the narratives um, were very rich, um, they were abundant, and they were full of stories that were surprising. <laughs> Um, sad, funny, um, we, we really enjoyed going through um, those accounts and drawing out some of the health and well-being outcomes that were being reported in the narratives. Um, so the reason why we focus on 2012 only is because uh, there, there was just too much. It was such rich information we had to sort of have um, parameters. Um, but they were basically some of the words that appeared in the candid recollections of what they were doing um, every week and every month with asylum seekers. For our analysis to make sense of what happens in the detention centres, we had to go back a step and think about what was the starting point before asylum seekers came into contact with um, the music facilitators. So situations of um, forced migration and um, seeking asylum usually involve loss of agency, loss of safety, loss of trust. Um, and asylum seekers spend sometimes their whole life attempting to regain a sense of safety, a sense of, a sense of trust or a sense of agency. Um, mandatory detention in that process con actually contributes to that loss of agency. Um, the lack of autonomy, uh, the loss of identity and culture, loss of connection to place, loss of voice, these are all some of the um, of the experiences that are associated with being in, um, in detention. So whether that's um, outside of Australian mainland, mainland or even in a um, more urban setting like in Brisbane. So what we, what we defined was a starting point was a situation where asylum seekers are dehumanised. Um, they are not treated as human beings anymore. And we, we found that the theme of dehumanisation is quite, well, is inherent to the, um, to the policies and processes of border protection, of detention, but also part of the political and popular discourses about asylum seekers as well. So that, that theme there is quite significant. So our analysis um, identified four key themes through the narratives. So the theme of, through music, the process of humanisation, the process of developing a sense of community, um, showing signs of resilience and then developing a sense of agency while, while being in detention. <coughs> and all those aspects can contribute to improving the well-being of the asylum seekers. <coughs> Is everybody still with me? Yeah, okay. So what I'll do over the next few slides, and please bear with me because it's there's quite a few to go through, but I'll explain um, the general theme and then I'll provide some examples from those um, narratives. So the examples will be in italics. So first of all, humanisation. So engagement in music opens the door to humanisation. Uh, it creates a new collective identity to voice suffering and hope through self-expression. Um, music allows musicians and asylum seekers 
as well as staff members within the detention centres to cross the boundaries enforced by the policies. And the expression of hospitality is also an important part of feeling human again. So some examples. As participating asylum seekers developed a new collective identity, um, music and singing activities offered an avenue to make sense of their circumstances through expression of emotions and hopes for the future. I remember thinking all the previously sad, forlorn and vacant eyes were shining, bristling, full of hope and energy. Two former participants confided how our singing together helped them so much while they were in detention and now they tell their friends and all the people they meet. Participants also showed a sense of hospitality, which was important, part, and important for them. The musicians as visitors were made to feel welcome into their home, the detention centre. One of the older men from Afghanistan came up to, up to us with two cups of piping hot tea. It was a lovely surprise. The man insisted on taking the cup from me. The manners these men show under extraordinary circumstances is incredible. Um, processes of humanisation extended among staff members. So Serco is a, a British-based company that's contracted out to manage the detention centres. Um, and some began to participate in the sessions or support um, participants to actively engage. The Serco staff members come into the room from time to time. They join in with the singing. They laugh and clap with the rest of us. Serco staff brought in five guitars and a keyboard in response to requests from the men to learn guitar. Okay, so the development of, uh, of a sense of community um, emerged from the, the sense of solidar solidarity sorry, among participants feeling welcome in a community of music uh, su and suggests that despite oppressive, the oppressive nature of their circumstances, um, participants have the ability to connect with one another. Tradition building within um, the, the setting of a detention centre created a common experience through music gatherings and was being passed on like an oral tradition. Music played a key role in providing respite from dire circumstances of collective fear, despair and trauma, while at the same time encouraging the formation of a more positively based sense of community. So some examples of that. Following the news of a, sun of a sunken boat of asylum seekers, participation in the music group enabled the expression of strong feelings of concern. A participant mentioned the recent asylum seeker boat that had disappeared in the ocean. He said nobody knows who was on the boat. It was obviously a very unsettling event for, the, for these men. They are constantly living in uncertainty and fear. We hope that the music would act as a distraction for those men who were obviously concerned about what was going on out at sea. So the songs written with previous participations became, participants sorry, became like an oral tradition. We find ourselves telling the same stories over again, how the songs were written back in the original Asylum Seeker Centre and what effect they had on those who participated, where those people are now. So it was quite important to say, you know, these people have now moved on to the community and, and have been able to um, achieve what they came to Australia for through the songs. Um, maintaining singing tradition in detention could reinforce a sense of belonging, contribute to developing a collective sense of hope. Um, for example, one woman's poetry became the basis for a collectively produced song. It was an ideal opportunity to showcase a tentative version of a new song that had emerged from her poem about her children, the ones who sustained her through the ordeal of escape and detention, the ones who gave her something to live for. So this particular woman's poems um, falls um, have, have been um, turned into songs that form the core repertoire of scattered people now. Um, okay, moving on now to resilience. Is that okay with everyone that I go through all the themes and then we can talk about them later on? So resilience manifests through the existence of community, people caring for one another, finding a voice. Music helps detainees to deal better with despair, anxiety, suffering, living in limbo, uncertainty and disappointment. And even if the well-being was only temporarily improved, this was a form of respite that may not have been available without music, singing and music facilitators weekly attendance. So some examples of that. Um, the participation in music encouraged um, uh, some asylum seekers to participate further in music activities. We invited anyone from the gathering to sing something. 
eyes turned towards a diminutive figure from Sri Lanka who had been sitting quietly. He began with hesitation but gathered strength. A hush descended on the room, even those at the computers swiveled around in their chairs. Some stood up and listened. And I must say that some of those stories were, uh, were provided after a long description of how, say, that particular participant had not uh, been engaged at all for a number of weeks and then there was one week when they finally decided that they could take part in the, in the gatherings. Um, so other examples, uh, participants other request, uh, often requested Western songs and pop songs. Mad World by Tears for Fears, All Around Me Are Familiar Faces, Worn Out Places, Worn Out Faces. Michael Jackson's They Don't Really Care About Us. We've Got to Get Out of This Place by Eric Burden and the Animals. Anybody familiar with those songs? Yeah. Um, the Eagles Hotel California was a particular favorite because of the chorus. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Songs like Pink Floyd's The Wall provided a healthy and therapeutic way for the men to express their feelings in a musical way. I tell you what, after you read your narratives, you can never listen to those songs in the same way ever again. Uh, it takes on a different meaning. Um, the effective impact of music enabled participants to feel relief from ongoing stresses. One facilitator recalled that a participant said, this singing is taking me into a new place and helps me forget for a while all my troubles. Another facilitator said, our capacity to recognize and appreciate paradox has been expanded significantly since coming to the detention center and listening to traumatized, medicated and depressed detainees entertain us with love songs in the language of their homeland. Um, and so then comes the theme of agency. And I guess agency was not a theme we were expecting to see in narratives concerning detention center, but there were several examples that indicated that um, participants were um, displaying more agency over time. And so they gradually took ownership of the mus musical activities. Um, facilitator facilitators observed more instances of participants making their own decisions, where they would lead rather than follow, where they showed initiative, where they reached out and expressed themselves. And the degree to which they showed a sense of agency re reclaimed within the confines of the detention center offers a strong counter-narrative to assume non-engagement of people in depressing circumstances. So some examples of that, um, of taking ownership of the process. One of the men produced a two-stringed instrument, which he called a rahab. He made it himself while he was in the Curtin Detention Center, that's in Perth, WA, uh, Western Australia, sorry. The lad played it and sang beautifully in spite of his instrument's two-string limitations. We were told that the song was about being in detention and waiting so long for freedom. Um, the, so the CD that I mentioned before, some of, some of those CDs were distributed to, um, to the asylum seekers in detention and so they could undertake their own musical engagement during the rest of the week when the music facilitators were not present. Um, and then they, they started singing uh, with more gusto because of that. So it became apparent that they had been familiarizing themselves with the songs because they all joined in. Opportunities to learn an instrument also encourage agency. It was decided to devote the last half hour of the evening to teaching those who were keen the guitar basics. More men heard the music from their huts and emerged and joined in the city. So the staff reinforced the importance of what we do. They said it does make a difference. They, are, they on the staff notice it. They normally collect the instruments after our sessions, but this time staff chose to leave them in the hands of the men who were still practicing. So these are some of the examples from the narratives and I've skimmed very briefly through them. I should clarify too that um, the, the narratives refer to the men. So during uh, 2012, which are the narratives we focused on, most of the people detained were single men and that changed afterwards. Um, now there are families, unaccompanied minors, um, children, etc. Okay, so I just want to briefly summarize some of the social cultural benefits that Naomi talked about before in the video, but they include things like positive cross-cultural engagements, um, expressing resistance and solidarity, familiarization with the Australian culture through the interaction with music facilitators, um, a new understanding of their own sense of self, release of tension, frustration, anger, um, an increased sense of hope about their future and a sense that their culture was respected by musicians and others who supported sweet freedom, whatever the dominant political and popular discourses. 
At the personal level, these narratives indicate that um, the benefits, with the relational experiences that validate their sense of humanity um, in a safe setting where they can express feelings, uh, music represented a means to share experiences, um, to share memories and tell stories, opportunities to use individual creative talent, and having one's skills and knowledge validated in a setting like a detention centre. Before I go on to the performance, I just want to mention a few things about what kind of research we hope to conduct in the future. Um, one is, of course, further testing of that framework. As I said, these are preliminary findings and we have planned further research, dependent on funding, of course, um, to further test that framework. Uh, and I've also mentioned in the video that we're also interested to look at the impact that these regular interactions is having on the mental health and well-being of music facilitators. They've often spoken about their own doubt about what they're actually achieving in the detention centres, um, about developing relationships and friendships with some of the detained asylum seekers and then getting there the next week and they're gone and they don't know what's happened to this person. Um, and then just generally sensing from political and popular discourse that the, um, uh, the, the broad discourse that depersonalizes asylum seekers, they know who are those people that, that the, the politicians are, are talking about. They, they see them every week and so it's quite hard um, to be continuing on with that initiative without sometimes feeling, well, is it worth it? Is it achieving anything? Um, of course, the bigger issue is to be able to conduct longitudinal studies on health and well-being outcomes. This is all very sort of short-term. This is what can be seen within the detention centres. Um, but we would be very interested to continue on and, um, to look at how uh, the impact of music, but in the longer term, and once asylum seekers are living in the community. Another aspect that uh, music facilitators have mentioned as important is how they see the changes in gender norms. So they're coming in, um, so the, the two regular musicians who go every Wednesday night, there's a man and a woman, and they, they often say, well, we, we are kind of the representatives of, Australia, of Australian men and Australian women, and they, they feel the weight of that, um, of that responsibility in a way, but they, they also um, noted in the narratives how some women, particularly Iranian women, whom they met for the first time, um, how they were during that first encounter, and then a few weeks down the track, how they had changed, what had changed physically, what had changed in their um, personality, in their um, approach to music and singing. So there's definitely uh, an important theme there. Phew, okay. <laughs> now, um, I will show you a, a YouTube clip of a performance that was recorded um, late last year. Um, there was a guest performer, Eugene Skeef, who's based in the UK. Um, so this is a record of, uh, of the performance. And so you'll get to see um, the musicians and uh, the asylum seekers that are part of Scattered People. We are from Iran, similar in Afghanistan. Some of us have escaped from the UK. Or something that I've skimmed over that I'm happy to clarify. Thank you, Caroline. 